to your town and the arts are the answer and we are celebrating interdependence this this month we are really excited about um, bringing to you some of the wonderful influences that have come from all over the world into our wonderful region and really makes Monterey County uh, really one of the best places in the world to live, to work, to play, to really just do about anything. And uh, we have a very special treat for you today with Melinda Coffee Armstead, who's going to talk to us about Zen and the Golden Spike. So Melinda, thank you so much for being here. My it's pleasure. such such a joy to have you. So Melinda, um, many of you may know her as a pianist, and she's now going to be a special musical docent at Tor House, and she is also an instructor at Ollie at CSUMB, and just an amazing, amazing person. Uh, you may know many things about her from all that she's given to our community in so many different ways. But right now, we, we have a really special presentation on the influences. How did Zen influences get to Monterey County? And really, through whom, right? So, Melinda, thank you. Thank you for having me. This is something I love to talk about. It's been a, a lifelong journey for me. I started over 50 years ago being interested in Asian art and Asian culture and philosophy in general. I and we have to say, we have to pause for just one second <laughs> to also say thank you to Jean Hurd for connecting oh, us in yes, this way. the Asian Art Society. I, I, yeah. I know you through the Church in the Forest and through other connections, <laughs> but, but here, this, this is a special connection. And so when she mentioned your name and said that you're an expert in this, I was so mm. ecstatic, you know, this is really perfect. Well, expert is being very generous, well. but it's something I'm extremely interested in, and I have given a couple lectures for the Asian Art Society okay. about the influence of Japanese art on Western art and Western culture, and the foundations of Japanese religious life, Taoism, Buddhism, Confucianism, and Shinto. So I have a little bit, a little bit, but I'm not an expert. Um, I've been reading reading my whole life, Joseph Campbell, Alan Watts. Uh, we've made several trips to the Far East, uh, twice to Japan. Yeah. And I've also been doing yoga here at the Carmel Foundation for over 10 years. Oh. So that's like my little, tiny, little Asian camp I go to every time I go that's to a phenomenal. yoga class. <laughs> so it all reinforces everything. And yeah. um, now that I've become connected to Tor House, um, more and more reading um, Robinson Jeffers, own writings which beautifully support the foundation beliefs of Taoism and Buddhism, which is, this is Robinson Jeffers' words, I believe that the universe is one being. All its parts are expressions of the same energy, and they're all in communication with each other, therefore parts of one organic whole. This is physics, I believe, as well as religion. Robinson Jeffers. So there I am in his house playing his Steinway piano, which he also had Ansel Adams in to house it for them. And in 1929, he and you know, were going crazy. to Ireland for a long trip. Yeah. And the Adamses were living in San Francisco, and he wanted to come down by himself and just play, because at that point, he hadn't decided whether he would follow the path of being a professional pianist or professional photographer. Wow. And I read a letter yesterday that Una wrote to a friend saying, well, if that man would ever just decide which way to go, <laughs> he might amount to something. <laughs> because he's, he's dividing his energies too much. He needs to just concentrate on one thing, yeah. and not the piano and photography. <laughs> so this was very funny. Um, so An Ansel, yeah, was also one of these nature environmentalist people who celebrated the beauty of our coastline of Big Sur and of Yosemite, yeah. of course. And Yosemite was where he had his transformational experience when he was a young man, when he was very, very young. And then he went there every summer thereafter and um, climbed, the, climbed the trails and was given his first camera at Yosemite. So the, the, the archetypal view of the Yosemite Valley is Ansel's picture. Yeah that we'll yeah. see. Yeah. And then, of course, um, it was only saved because John Muir saved Yosemite with the help of Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah. And there's a wonderful image of them standing at Glacier Point with the valley and the Yosemite Falls behind them. That's amazing. And, and that was only because John Muir was the original flower child who came out from Scotland and from the East Coast 
and wanted desperately to get away from cities. He landed in San Francisco and says, get me out of here. I just want to be someplace wild. And he loved the wild outdoors. And uh, like the, the reading I read you from Robinson Jeffers, there's a beautiful sentence from his letters. John Muir says, when we contemplate the whole globe as one great dewdrop, striped and dotted with continents and islands, flying through space with other stars all singing and shining together as one, the whole universe appears as an infinite storm of beauty. I love that. That's so, so storm amazing. Storm of beauty. And so how, did you, how did you yourself discover these connections? You're interested, but how did you... How did you really get into, was it through the Tour House directly, or did you have other ways in you know, was that earlier. led to the Tour House? It was, it, it's been earlier, because, well, every time we go to Yosemite, of course, you have to go see the film, and there's a mm -hmm. magnificent film by Ken Burns about John Muir. Yeah. So we, we just did that recently in May, again. We, yeah. can't, we can't stay away, we love it. But I also read um, deeply and um, omnivorously, so I had also read Emerson and Thoreau, and realized, a hundred years earlier, yeah. they're on the same page. They're all on the same page, um, and they. If you, you know, if you're reading Alan Watts or Shunru Suzuki or Thoreau, if I gave you this quote, you would be hard put to guess who said this. Okay, so here's another one. Yeah. I'll read it first, and then I'll tell you who okay, said good. it. See if you can guess. <laughs> you must live in the present. Launch yourself on every wave. Find your eternity in each moment. Fools stand on their island of opportunities and look toward another land. There is no other land. There is no other life but this. That's pure Zen. Yeah. It's pure American transcendentalism. It's Henry David Thoreau. I almost get that. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> no. That's phenomenal. So, so there's a you movement. Can hear so much right in the, just those few words, mm -hmm. uh, all the different influences. And is that what you mean by the golden spike? The golden spike is my metaphor for this wave of Buddhistic nature worship thought, which moved from the East Coast towards California, and at the same time was moving from Japan and China to California with the immigration, with the gold rush and the railroad. Those people came in the 1860s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and the, the wave came from the East Coast and from Europe, tr getting away from the Industrial Revolution, getting away from oh, yeah. the American Civil War, yeah. and the ravages of the Gilded Age, which was pretty <laughs> grim, unless you were a Biltmore or a Rockefeller. Yeah. So people like John Muir couldn't wait to get away from the cities, and they came west, and the Japanese came east, and they met in California in the most fertile way, so that there was a huge energy that came together, especially after World War II. Mm -hmm. The World War II episode is very, very difficult for the Japanese community, but afterwards, mm -hmm. they recouped, they came back to their temple in San Francisco, which had been a Jewish synagogue. Um, they came back, and they imported a, a Buddhist priest from Japan, from Kamakura, Japan, and that was Shunryu Suzuki. Mm -hmm. He came out, he was 53 years old, and he was, he had always wanted to visit the West. He'd been yeah. interested, but he'd been discouraged from doing that when he was younger. So here he is, he's 53, he arrives in San Francisco, and the traditional Japanese community, which are women who clean houses and men who are craftsmen and who do labor, yeah. wanted a traditional Buddhist community center who would do christenings and weddings and funerals, uh -huh. and everything in the traditional way. Yeah. But at the same time, there were these beatniks coming in, Alan Ferlinghetti and Alan Ginsberg and Gary Snyder and Michael McClure and Alan Watts, all these people coming to San Francisco, and they wanted to practice Zazen, which is seated meditation. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so he started letting them come in the mornings and practice with him. And after a while, the Buddhist community, the Japanese community said, wait a minute, you can't divide your time this way. Either devote yourself to us 100% yeah. or leave. Mm -hmm. And so he thought about it and he left. And they got somebody else to support their traditional community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Suzuki, with help from this white beatnik, San Francisco Renaissance artistic poet storm of energy created the San Francisco Zen Center, mm -hmm. Tassajara Mountain Zen Center, which is the first Buddhist monastery in the world outside Japan. Mm 
uh -huh. and mm -hmm. the Green Gulch. And from the, now we have Los Altos and yeah. Santa Cruz and Minneapolis and Boulder and Los Angeles and, and there are Buddhist centers all over the country. Mm -hmm. But the, the original at epicenter was in San Francisco yeah. at this time. And so that was, you know, that was an amazing sudden rush of energy. And then the poor man died in 1971. He was very young, but he, there was enough momentum already established for all of those things to keep going, and they're thriving. They're thriving to this day. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we're so, so fortunate. <clears throat> um, Alan Watts also played a huge role. He came out from England, was an Anglican priest, was the chaplain at Northwestern University, and uh, the, the image I have of him is first he's in his suit and tie and his short yeah. hair. He <laughs> looks like a proper <laughs> academic. <laughs> think of that. He resigned the priesthood. <laughs> yeah. And then he went native. He went to Japanese Buddhism, and he loved traditional Japanese Buddhism as it is tinged by Taoism. So again, it's about nature worship and living now and appreciating everything that's in front of you, not living in the past and not living in the future, but right now. So everything that he wrote, there's 20 books or so, are all focused to trying to help people find their way to live in that kind of ecstatic moment by moment appreciation of their life. Mm. So they don't waste it, yeah. but it's now. Which is easier to do when you are really immersed in the natural world, as wild as possible, right? Is that part of the I think I think nature idea. is a fantastic teacher. And yeah. I think we forget if we if you're living in an urban environment and you have a job, say that's nine to five and mm. you have these set routines um, you can get lost in that and think that's real life. But even here, I, I feel like <laughs> there's some times when I realize, oh my gosh, I've been going for weeks without going, going to the outside. ocean. It is right here. Well, or even going outside. I might spend oh. hours and hours and hours without going outside. Mm -hmm. I might spend weeks without going to the ocean or go hiking or something. You need so to be even, outside. even here where we're so blessed with so many um, great places to be outdoors. And they're close. We have to yeah. think about it and, <laughs> and be more proactive in our lives make to the, do that. Make the conscious effort. So, and so here are all these wonderful writers and artists who are, who are really just urging us on, it mm -hmm. seems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gary Snyder was part of that group, and he says, nature is not a place to visit. <laughs> it is <laughs> home. <laughs> It is home, so that's where you need to be spending time. <laughs> we have to really reorient our thinking completely. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, and that there was a wonderful conflagration of energy in 1967. I was um, in the junior year of high school when the human bee-in happened in Golden Gate Park, and that got a lot of attention, yeah, a lot of press, <laughs> and we heard about it. And they were all chanting. Uh, Allen Ginsberg had them chanting ecstatically in union, this is, this is really it, and it is really perfect. This is really it, and it is really perfect, over and over and over again. Um, and those kids, of course, that became not only the environmental movement, but the yeah. anti-war movement. And I hope that carries forward. Now, we need the environmental movement and the Sierra Club more than ever. Yeah. So that was the beginning of something very powerful. Um, Joseph Campbell was part of that group, too. He, he and Alan Watts were friends. Uh, there's a wonderful story of a, a Christmas dinner Alan Watts cooked, and the guests were Joseph Campbell and his wife and John Cage. So that, the, all this group, there's the most amazing interplay of yeah. these bright minds, and they also, they all taught the seminars at Esalen, yeah. and they, you know, they helped each other get their books published, and they were on the lecture circuit together. So that, that was a profound influence as well. Um, of course, I think a lot of people nowadays remember Joseph Campbell because of the TV series of The right. Power of Myth yeah. and The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Those are the two probably the most famous works, but there are many more. Um, he loved that image of the Earth, the blue dot, yes, uh, sitting, floating in space, yeah. surrounded by the black void. That was on the, cal the cover of the whole Earth catalog mm -hmm. in the 60s and yeah. 70s. That yeah. was a beautiful, beautiful image. Yeah. Um, and he hoped that that would be a transformative image for our times, that people would see it and they would realize that's our lifeboat. There's nowhere else to go. Yeah. There's no borders. There's no divisions. We had better take really good care of it and take care of each other because this is it. So that, that for him, I wonder what he would think now if our, our culture seems to have gone in other directions with the digital age. 
Yeah, there's, that'd there's be really interesting to to hear their take on on some of these kinds of things. And mm -hmm. um, my guess is they would still see the opportunities. There's dangers everywhere, mm -hmm. but th the mm -hmm. opportunities are still out there too. And the Sierra Club is really there, but struggling. I think they're struggling, and especially in, with legislation now. There definitely has uh, to be even more effort to protect what we what yes. we have, what we see, to protect our own home. Yes. I mean, that's that's the this thing. This is our home. Yeah, this is it. Definitely. We're in this lifeboat yeah. together. Yeah. There's no plan B. <laughs> you know, we had better take care of it. <laughs> Definitely. Sooner the better. <laughs> well, this is so, so awesome to explore all these things with you. Um, can I know that you have a lot um, of time where you have uh, given much more detailed and longer um, talks at Ollie. Can you talk oh, about the, the, how you got involved in that? Love and to. What is up, maybe also upcoming? Talk of uh, interconnectedness. I was in a book club. And I read and led a book called The Hair with Amber Eyes. Oh, and what's that? It's, it's uh, the true story of a Jewish family that were rich Russian merchants and bankers who had a mansion in Paris in the 1870s. And had a one of them sons had a huge art collection yeah. of Japanese netsuke, which are these small carvings yes, used as a toggle yeah, to, yeah. to hold the little uh -huh. pouch from falling through the obi. It's a s about the size of a walnut. They had a great exhibit at Hartnell College with that. Yes. Yeah. And this, this th introduced me to a great deal of the history of Japanese art and its inclusion on in, um, influence on the French art scene of the 1870s and <laughs> 80s. So I led this book. And Chris Woods was a member of the club, and she's a friend with Michelle Crompton, who <laughs> runs Ollie. So we had coffee, and she said, Melinda should really do a thing <laughs> about this book and do, right. do my Japanese art thing. So I did, so that was the first one. Oh, Out wow. of the hair with amber eyes came how the French fell in love with Japan. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a good success, and so she let me expand it to three sessions, six hours across, um, in search of the soul of Japan, which is the religious foundation's religious mm -hmm. Taoism, yeah. Confucianism, Buddhism, Sancho, and the effect on the French art and European art in the 19th century, and then all the other gifts of Japan to the West, wow. which brought us up to the present day and to things like the Zen Buddhism and Tassajara. So well, we so have to um, leave it at there. That's going to be phenomenal to pursue. Can you um, let us know if there's just one more thing that you really want people to remember and, and to take away from your wonderful readings of all these different things and your expo explorations, what would that be? Um, thought for the day yeah. is the universe is basically playful. It's not going anywhere. It has no destination, no place it has to be, no time it has to be. It is playful. And this is by analogy with music, which I know something about. You don't <laughs> work the piano, you play the piano. And like dancing, when you dance, it's not because you're trying to get somewhere. You dance for the joy of the dance itself, for the joy of that movement. It's a musical thing. You need to dance while your music is playing. So be here now. Enjoy the music while it lasts. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. It's been just a joy to talk with you. Thank you. Thank Paul. you. <laughs>